on today's World Insight with Ken Wei, Chinese Vice President Wang Qishan in the Middle East to drum up diplomacy and innovation. And an iconic bridge further connecting Hong Kong to China's mainland. Will infrastructure bring about integration? Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The program coming to you live on CGTN. Chinese Vice President Wang Qishan has gone on a four-nation tour of the Middle East. First stop, Israel, where he met Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Monday. In the next seven days, Vice President will visit Palestine, Egypt, and the United Arab Emirates. Let's take a look. The most senior Chinese official to visit Israel in nearly two decades. On Monday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu welcomed Chinese Vice President Wang Qishan in Jerusalem. Mr. Netanyahu called Wang's visit a big compliment to Israel and a reflection of the growing ties between China and the Jewish state. Israel is often referred to as the tech hub of the Middle East, earning the name Silicon Wadi. The match between Israel's core technology development and China's huge market has been an area of interest between the two countries. A highlight of the Chinese vice president's trip will be his co-hosting with the Israeli Prime Minister of the fourth meeting of the China-Israel Joint Commission on Innovation and Cooperation. Looking to expand business and trade opportunities, the Vice President is accompanied by a group of Chinese business leaders including Jack Ma, the CEO of the Asian e-commerce giant Alibaba. Israel's traditional alliance with the U.S. hardly stopped it from forging closer ties with China. As Israel's largest trading partner in Asia, China has also been a fast-growing source for Israel's tourism. The number of Chinese tourists to Israel rose by 41% in 2017. After Israel, the Chinese VP will travel to Palestine, Egypt, and the United Arab Emirates, where China seeks to help grow trade and investment. China hopes a stronger economy will help usher in peace for this part of the world. What to expect from Chinese Vice President Wang Qishan's visit to the Middle East in Beijing? We have Li Guofu, Director of the Center for Middle East Studies with the China Institute of International Studies. And in Hong Kong, we invited Philip Metodi, the founder and chief executive officer of Duotem Capital Limited. He is the co-author of the book, Israel and China from Silk Road to Innovation Highway. I want to welcome both of you gentlemen to the program. Mr. Matodi, obviously it seems the book title has already been translated into reality, but the question is, when it comes to innovation, to what degree will the two countries be able to cooperate, China and Israel? Well, thanks for having me here. Obviously, this visit is uh, very important, and it's not because uh, Vice President Wang is the highest ranking official from China to visit Israel for almost 20 years, but it is knowledge of Israel. He's an absolute expert in history of Israel, and above all, he knows technology and what's happening in the Israeli ecosystem very, very well. Now, the fact that he's chairing the Chinese side for this uh, joint innovation committee, having Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister as a counterparty, really shows mm. that both parties take this initiative very seriously. Um, the business exchange and bilateral ties have increased dramatically over the last 10 years, but our views is just the beginning. I think we'll see much more activities over the next few years. Mm. And Mr. Metodi, of course, uh, people love to hear about the positive side of the story, particularly when there's an important visit going on between the two countries. But one has to point to the other side of the story as well. Right before Chinese Vice President visit to Israel, there were certain reports circling around suggesting high-level officials in Israel military, suggesting there is risk uh, involving China too much, in his word, in cooperating with Israel, particularly when it comes to infrastructure yeah. and innovation. Mr. Matodi, your thoughts about that? Right. Let, let me tell you, I think both sides are very pragmatic. Obviously, the relationship between Israel and China has always been very complex. 
Having said that, since both sides have made it very clear that there is this political will to increase you know, these ties and this cooperation, I don't believe that uh, these concerns are legitimate. We are still seeing an incredible, incredible amount of new investments coming from China across the board, from medical to health care to uh, water to cybersecurity. And there are obviously concerns, but I don't think, as I said, they're legitimate. And again, I think we're just going to see more and more of these exchanges between the two countries. I see. Mr. Li, from China's perspective, what do you make of those uh, apparent concern from some of those in the military in Israel? And what about the general picture as China sees it? I think, you know, as you said, that, you know, some of, you know, the forces or some of, you know, the elements in Israel, they have raised this issue of uh, security. They are afraid that, you know, if uh, Israel depended too much on China, especially these very sensitive, you know, high tech and also, you know, some uh, technologies, and especially, you know, as our friends said, that, you know, some, you know, the issues China and Israel do not see eye to eye. So they said, you know, they would like some of the Western countries to set up sort of a mechanism to see or check, you know, the deeply involved of China, especially in the areas of high tech. Well, but that is their thought. I, I that is their thought. But Mr. Lee, when I'm asking about your thought, what yeah, do you yeah. make of the reality so far? I think, you know, generally, I would say, especially, you know, under the leadership of Premier you know, Netanyahu, he viewed China as, you know, the rising power. And he once said that, you know, the Israel is very small and some way it depends on the outside powers to you know, guarantee its security. And uh, from the historical you know, point of view, uh, both uh, Jewish people and the Chinese people wouldn't have any uh, conflicts. What we have is very closely sort of relations, especially the Jewish people are very sensible for the Chinese, uh, and especially during the Second World War. Right. We have received a large number of Jewish refugees from the Europeans. So, you know, Netanyahu is uh, determined this, we call it the strategic shift to have a good close relations with China. Well, there might be words about that, as we know, and widely reported in the media, but how to see that? I mean, Netanyahu, as the Prime Minister, certainly understand uh, between China and the United States, uh, which is uh, the biggest ally of Israel, by the way. Uh, there is an apparent trade war going on. There might be very different things uh, that the two countries are not seeing eye to eye on. And also, uh, what would that mean for Israel's potential with China? Will they limit it to mainly uh, economic and trade ties, uh, uh, Mr. Met Metoli? Well, you know, it's, it's very interesting that actually this, um, this willingness to increase ties actually comes from both the public and private sectors. Mm. You mentioned you know, in your opening remarks that Jack Ma uh, is part of the trip. Jack Ma was actually in Israel in May and he def believes that Israel is one of the three most important countries for China. Now again, I think we should downplay the concerns about um, the military and the role, the growing role in China. Uh, and I give you one example, the ports, two of the bi biggest mm. ports in Haifa, Israel for example. are operated by Chinese company Haifa and Hajdad. Mm -hmm. So they are operated by Chinese companies. If you travel throughout Israel, you will see that the, the bridges, the tunnels, uh, the major infrastructures are all built by Chinese companies. So they are obviously, in the, because Israel is a true democracy and probably the only true democracy in the Middle East, so it's, it's normal that some people would debate, but again, I would downplay this and I think that the relationship is strong and the relationship is getting stronger. Mm. We'll see how the relation is going, particularly with quite a strong foundation, at least when it comes to trade and economic ties. If we take a look at this, China and Israel have traditionally closed economic ties. China has been the top market for Israeli exports in East Asia and it is Israel's second top export partner after the United States. China also Israel's 
third largest trading partner and export market after the U.S. and the European Union. There we go, a lot of numbers over there certainly indicating the significance of China both as a market and also as a trading partner with Israel. By the way, if we study the numbers, the Israel's export to China jumped 60 percent just within the eight months and the 10 months that we have seen this year compared to 2017. Very impressive. Meanwhile, China's export to Israel 10 percent as well. So you see the trade ties is certainly increasing. But uh, Mr. Matoji, uh, how should we understand this? Is this uh, about two countries, particularly China, looking for alternative markets? Is it because uh, the U.S.-China uh, trade dispute and therefore Israel is having more trade opportunities in China? How should we understand the numbers with the, a bigger context? Right. For, first, we have to understand that even if the numbers have increased dramatically, they remain quite small. That's I mean, true. the business relationship with China only represents five percent of the Israeli economic activity, which really shows a tremendous potential. Now, the relationship between the two countries is what I define as a perfect match. Uh, cost of labor in Israel, as you probably know, is extremely high, so Israel wants to focus on high, highly value-added products, R&D, technology. And more and more Israeli companies are looking at China to manufacture you know, their products. Likewise, even if technology in China has improved dramatically, they have realized, and this is again what Jack Ma and a couple of very large business people have said, they realize that Israel can make of China what it wants to become, meaning a, a major, major uh, technological superpower. And I guess there is this political will to make it happen. So I, I think we have reached the point of no return. This is going to happen. Mm, Mr. Lee, of course, this is uh, uh, the second time Jack Ma, one of the most well-known entrepreneurs from China now for the world, has been to Israel. That has been mentioned repeatedly by our Israeli friend, Mr. Matoli. But uh, Mr. Lee, China also has its own concerns when developing further relationship with Israel. For example, when it comes to the issue of Palestinian, uh, issue is the two countries certainly have very different opinions and of course Chinese Vice President after Israel visiting Palestine as well so uh, with that in mind to what extent China can uh, free willingly in a way develop its relationship with Israel besides trade and economic ties I think for quite a long time we have tried to persuade our you know friends both uh, you know the Palestinians friends and also Israeli friends now for the long term or the fundamental interests of the two peoples, you know, they need to make a peace. And even, you know, for the Israelis, you know, to, to some extent, uh, on some issues, we do not see eye to eye. But, the, you know, fundamentally we have to make sure that, you know, we wanted the Israel to survive and the security. And we also want, you know, the uh, Palestinians uh, the rights also should be uh, guaranteed. You can see that you know our policy towards both the Israeli and the Palestinians are very much uh, balanced. You know, uh, during you know our Vice President Wang Qishan's visit to Israel, he also will make uh, a visit to uh, Ramana and to have uh, talks with mm. the Palestinian Prime Minister. And also, you know, we try and make our efforts to promote, uh, to promote peace process between uh, Israel and the Palestinians. And we also you know, try to make a uh, close you know, relations with the Palestinian people. At the same time, you know, we we'll go further with our friends in Israel. Mm. Of course, uh, we are already quite familiar with the photo of uh, Chinese Vice President Wang Qishan placing a prayer of peace at the Western Wall in the old city. And that certainly is a peace message coming from, I think, representing the Chinese, really, from China uh, for people in the Middle East, whether they are Israelis or the Palestinians. Uh, by the way, having said that, though, when it comes to real innovation uh, cooperation, there has been several deals likely to be signed, already signed, science and technology, life sciences, innovation, digital health, agriculture. These are areas that Israel are, 
which is quite strong when it comes to technology. But Mr. Matodi, to what extent, once again, Israel is willing to share uh, on a commercial basis with China and others about these technologies? And what, how will that be able to advance the true and the genuine nature of this cooperation between the two? Mr. Matodi. Okay. The um, relationship, as I said, has been very strong for many years. And actually, we backdate the strong relationship between the Chinese and the Jewish people to the second century. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, there are so many opportunities. You mentioned healthcare. Definitely, China has identified that Israel could be a major healthcare player in the Chinese market. And we see a very large number of Chinese investors coming to Israel looking at healthcare technology. Now, clean tech is also an area where Israel is very good at, whether it's waste management, it's water purification, water desalinization. As you probably know, the largest desalinization plant in China, which was built in Tianjin, is actually built by an Israeli company. Mm. Now, it is very, very obvious that Israel needs, wants and needs to develop this relationship with China. Israel probably has one of the strongest economies in the OECD. It has high growth, it has low inflation, it has no unemployment. But in order to sustain this, the Chinese market is actually the engine that will allow Israel to continue to perform. Mm. Mr. Li, Belt and Road Initiative, of course, that's going to have a big impact on many of the Middle Eastern countries, those in Europe and also Eurasian areas. Uh, but to Israel, uh, what does that mean? And to some of the other countries and places that the Chinese Vice President to visit, Palestine uh, and several other Middle Eastern countries, what would that mean as well? Is this going to, in a way, clear the way for doubts and therefore let the real cooperation projects get underway? I think, you know, um, we see that in the Israeli are very, you know, and uh, active and uh, positive to receive the Chinese initiative of one road, uh, you know, the uh, one built one road, you know, this initiative. Uh, and uh, for the Israeli size, uh, on one hand, you know, to end the, this uh, framework, uh, you know, if both sides, you know, join efforts uh, to, you know, to promote you know, this, you know, one road, one uh, built initiative uh, can closely, you know, link two uh, countries, uh, you know, corporations. Mm. On the, the other hand, because China had a very good, you know, reputation, we have uh, every, you know, friends in the Middle East. We see that the Israelis' economic, uh, you know, approach, or its, you know, orientation is always uh, towards the Europeans uh, by, you know, you know, closely joined, you know, the Chinese uh, this right. initiative, you know, is really can make some friends and the framework to working closely with you know the regional countries, the Arab countries. I think you know, this is a part of the of the is really you know what they think they can do and also you know China can do. All right, uh, but on the other hand, uh, about Belt and Road, there have been quite some debates recently about the idea, particularly the implementation from different perspectives. And Mr. Matodi, what would that mean for Israel's decision about how much to cooperating, to cooperate rather on BRI and to what extent can Israel uh, contribute to the further of the idea of BRI? After all, it's an initiative raised by China, but it's about partnership. Therefore, it's not just about China, it's about everybody joining in. If to make things happen, Mr. Matodi. You know, I always like to compare the One Belt, One Road uh, policy with the Silk Road. And needless to say, the reason why you have still today a fairly large Jewish presence in the historical cities of the Silk Road, uh, whether we Hong Kong or Shanghai or Singapore, uh, clearly shows that this has been in the Jewish and Chinese DNA to collaborate. As I mentioned earlier, this is, this is a fact. Something that I want to emphasize as well, uh, it's very important for China to have access to commodities. And obviously, Africa offers a tremendous reserve of commodities. And if you want to bring commodities from Africa to China by land, if you look at a map, it has to go via Israel. And this is what China, together with the Israeli government, are looking at some major infrastructure projects 
that would facilitate transport of goods from uh, Africa and the Middle East into China. Mm. But Mr. Matodi, another bigger question, even more than just the Belt and Road, is the general debate that is going on in the world about trade, about nature of trade, about direction of trade, about how trade will be done for the future. You know that better probably than I do. So therefore, what role is Israel going to play in that global debate? Which direction Israel hopes the world head for? You know, I think Israel would be no exception to any other country that is not directly involved in the trade war between uh, China and the U.S. So initially, these countries that are not directly affected will benefit, especially countries that are export-oriented. Now, if this trade war results in a slowdown of the global economy, obviously these economies are also going to be affected. Now, as you rightly pointed out, it is possible for two friends to disagree on some matters. And again, I think the relationship with, between Israel and China is getting closer by the day, but there will be areas of disagreement, and I think it's a healthy part of a relationship. Mm. Mr. Lee, briefly before we go. I, I think uh, you know, the Israeli you know, can play a very positive or active role, uh, in, in, you know, especially in you know, China's, uh, we call the trade war with the United States, because uh, Israel is very close friends of uh, America and also at the same time very close friends of uh, China and the Jewish people knows much better than you know the Western countries about China's culture uh, philosophy so you know uh, Jewish uh, you know people especially Israel can uh, play something like a good between how to make you know China and the United States more understood by each other we hope that will be the case. Thank you so much for now. With the two of you, Li Guofu, Philip Metodi, really appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. Stay with Thanks us here us. on World Insights. Still to come on the program, the opening of the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge, the world's longest sea bridge spanning China's Greater Bay Area. What the bridge means for business right after this break. Welcome back. You're watching World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. The first crossing ceremony of the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge took place this morning on Tuesday. Construction began in 2009 with the world's longest sea bridge connecting the Greater Bay Area. Businesses are eyeing for the opportunities it could bring. Before we start our discussion, take a look at this. I declare the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge is now officially open. Travel time around the Greater Bay Area is about to change. Before the opening of the bridge, it would take around four hours to travel from Hong Kong to Zhuhai on land, and commuting between Hong Kong and Macau relies mainly on slow and weather-dependent ferry transport. With the bridge, it is expected to cut the travel time between either of the two cities down to about an hour. It creates a three-hour commuting radius from Hong Kong to the mainland China. With the high-speed rail and with this bridge, we are able to live in mainland China and work in Hong Kong. 55 kilometers long in total, the Hong Kong to Hai Macau Bridge is the world's longest sea bridge, costing over $18 billion. The bridge has an estimated service life of 120 years. Most people in the Greater Bay Area look to the opportunities the new bridge can bring, among other things, a boost on tourism. Now at this point in time, we're about 8% up compared to the year before. So we're looking at probably at the end of this year, 35 million visitors. The bridge is an integral part of China's ambitious plan to create a more integrated Greater Bay Area. With a combined population of around 70 million and an economy of over one and a half trillion U.S. dollars, it is one of the most economically vibrant regions in the world. The new bridge is expected to significantly improve economic integration across the region. For more about that, joining us in Beijing studio, Stephen Phillips, Director General of Invest Hong Kong. Stephen, welcome to CGTN studio. 
Very well, thank you very much for having me. Good to see you. That bridge, wow. 55 kilometers long, very impressive, 20 billion US dollars. What would that mean for you and the thing that you are trying to do to attract as many to invest in Hong Kong as possible? Well, I think the bridge is a really key piece of infrastructure um, that is opening up new commercial opportunities, um, both within Hong Kong to Macau and within the wider Greater Bay Area. Um, but the bridge is also supplemented by the high-speed rail link from Hong Kong to Shenzhen and then on to Guangzhou and then connecting with the high-speed rail network across the country. So it's a really exciting time commercially to see this region opening up um, connecting the 11 cities in the Greater Bay Area right. all will be within roughly one hour's travelling distance from each other. How and significant is it, Stephen, commercially particularly? Yeah. I guess you are already touching on that. This Delta area for you, for what you are doing to attract investors into Hong Kong? Yeah, I, I think it's probably the issue that is catching the imagination of the companies that we're talking to mm. around the world in a way that is incredibly exciting. They see a population close to 70 million people um, with the highest GDP the size per capita. Of the UK. Exactly, exactly the size of the UK and the GDP already equivalent to Korea or Australia. So it's a very significant market already. But it's also got some phenomenal ingredients there. Mm. You've got the traditional strengths of Hong Kong as an international financial services centre. Mm. You've got the innovation taking place in Shenzhen and in wider Guangdong and Hong Kong's own plans around innovation. Right. It's really going to make this part of the world, I think, one of the fastest growing clusters um, at a global level. We have to admit that things have been changing while this bridge is being built, right? Mm -hmm. um, you see geopolitical changes, you see debates about globalization, you see uh, China's debates with some of the other countries when it comes to trade, when it comes to several other issues. So uh, will this bridge still be as 100% or even more uh, in a way uh, helping to link Hong Kong and the mainland and helping to bring vibrancy into the region. Is that a question mark in your mind? I don't think it's a question mark at all. Actually, I think there's quite a lot of uncertainty um, in the global mm. um, commercial landscape. But what we see taking place in southern China with this integration of the cities is really happening now. Mm. The physical infrastructure is now in place. It's open today. The high-speed rail opened a few weeks ago. The business will follow, um, and we're already seeing companies actively looking at thinking about their strategy for the whole region, rather than looking at things on an isolated piecemeal basis. What does that mean when companies are trying to readjust in a way also to take advantage of both the rail and also the train? Uh, what does that mean from your perspective, the things that they have to think about right now? Well, I, I think for us, um, representing the Hong Kong government, we have to be able to talk much more coherently about a much bigger landscape. Mm. But it also means that we have to work very closely with our counterparts in the cities in Guangdong. That's right. Um, and work out actually how um, Hong Kong can be a complement to what companies will be doing in Zhongshan or Zhuhai or in uh, um, Guangzhou. If you look at the rise of these uh, cities, uh, mm -hmm. uh, first tier like Guangzhou and Shenzhen, second tier, third tier, even fourth tier cities now in the Delta region, that mm -hmm. means Hong Kong is facing quite stiff competition coming from many of those different county cities from the mainland. On the one hand, it is cooperation, but on the other hand, it is competition as well, particularly if you have the efficiency as the rail and also the bridge has already created. What about that? Well, you're absolutely right. Um, with a partner city, in the morning we can be a competitor, in the afternoon we can be a collaborator. Um, and that won't change. That is the inevitability um, of looking to attract investment mm. into a particular city. And we have, as Hong Kong, competition not only from nearby cities, mm. but cities across the world. So we're used to competition. And in Hong Kong, we have the confidence that the environment is so good 
and that the potential is so great. When we look at Hong Kong, we look at Hong Kong in the context of China and then Hong Kong in the context of Asia, that there's a compelling business case for more companies to invest. When you talk about confidence, it's very important that we look at Hong Kong, the advantages and the challenges it faces. Will Hong Kong be able to take great advantage of its plus, which is about financing, which is about in, uh, more interconnected with the rest of the world, which is about standards, which is about rule of law, uh, compared to what has to, it has to catch up, which is the efficiency of decision making. Uh, can they be able to do both? Yes. If you look at the policy address given by our chief executive, Carrie Lam, just a few weeks ago, she's taken, along with her colleagues in the rest of government, some very bold decisions on the future of Hong Kong in terms of investment into education, mm. investment into healthcare, investment into land supply, which is a critical social issue in Hong Kong. So these big issues that need to be addressed are being addressed by the government But right the plan now. is the plan. How to implement the plan and during this process of implementing the plan, is there going to be efficiency? That's what the investors are looking for. That's what the investors are interested in. Yep. Well, what, what I can say is that as part of government, I know that we're working full steam ahead to see these plans turn into reality. So there's a lot of great work going on. And I know from the investors that we're talking to that they're seeing that reality. Another thing is if you look at the innovation, which has been a key word you mentioned yeah. repeatedly, also one of your major job description to mm -hmm. create and promote innovation with more investment in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong used to be a financial center. How to make that transition is a, a, also an interesting question. Yep. While well, you have so much competition and actually much more matured investment mm -hmm. and environment in those countries and cities already. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, but I think, again, the government has decided to tackle head-on mm. um, the whole innovation agenda. There's a recognition that Hong Kong has some catching up to do. So there are four areas in particular where Hong Kong wants to excel right. in AI and robotics, in fintech, in smart cities, and in biotech. Um, and the government is taking some bold steps, um, particularly in AI and biotech, both to create international clusters of academic excellence, mm -hmm. so international academics working with Hong Kong academics to do fundamental research, right. and then commercialization sitting alongside that. And then with smart cities, a great opportunity. Absolutely. Such a um, highly densely populated city, and the economics of rolling out new technology for smart cities mm. initiatives um, should be very good. There has been a transitional period of time of economy here on the mainland. Hong Kong, so closely linked to the economic development of the mainland, certainly is feeling the temperature of that as well. When you are talking about investment, there seems to be a streamline of companies these days that want to stay safe and they want to stay intact before they see more opportunities comes up. So how would you be able to persuade them and many others to continue to invest even though they are seeing global uncertainties, even though they are seeing a transitional period of time for the Chinese economy as well. Mm -hmm. Stephen. Well, I, I think you're right. I think companies um, are obviously looking very carefully at how geopolitical issues are playing out. But that is the people that are focused on trade. But also the transitional period of the Chinese economy as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, clearly China is going through a very rapid period of change um, and to a degree some consolidation as well. Um, and companies are looking very carefully at how that's happening. But when we're talking to international and mainland investors, mm -hmm. they're looking at rather longer time horizons. So they're looking at the fundamentals um, of the Chinese economy, the mm -hmm. fundamentals of the wider Asian regional economies, which in that midterm remain very positive. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at the demographics, they remain That's very right. strong, whether you're looking the at China, whether indicators. you're looking at Indonesia, whether you're looking at Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And the fundamentals um, in that midterm are strong. So companies need to obviously deal with short-term issues, but they also need to be looking at growth opportunities mm -hmm. in the future. 
So many of the people that we're talking to remain very upbeat mm. about that longer term outlook for the region well, and they're sure planning ahead. Well, I would take your argument, but at the same time, one of the important issues people look at is credits, debts, where the money come from. Mm -hmm. So if you look at credits, of course, uh, Chinese economy has already been able to, in a way, create enormous amount of wealth and certainly the sustainable possibility of investment. But at the same time, you do also notice, Stephen, that uh, during this transition, many of the companies are taking what you call a wait and see attitude. Meanwhile, you also see debt issues. Uh, some of the companies expand too fast within such a short period of time using commercial bank, uh, probably preferable loans. And now when there's a transition of the economy, certain things are getting much more difficult. So these are factors that are facing many of the companies that you are talking about. How do you see the short-term bumps? And what would that mean for your job? Well, I think we talk to a very broad cross-section of companies. Mm. Um, some companies in, let's say, more traditional industries um, perhaps are facing more challenges mm. as the economic landscape changes. Um, perhaps, as you say, some of them might be straddled with some um, debt issues. Whereas if you look at other sectors mm -hmm. of the economy, which are growing very quickly, in innovation-led sectors, um, in fintech, in smart cities, um, in biotech, um, those companies don't actually have lack of access to capital and they're growing very quickly. Mm. So it's a mixed picture overall. Um, so I, I don't think you can draw a conclusion across the entire economy right. um, from saying that you know, some companies are facing debt issues. Right. Some companies are facing their own transitional issues as they need to change their business models, adapt to um, a changing economy. Mm. What a pleasure to see you here in Beijing and certainly even better since we are meeting today. It's a big day for Hong Kong with that beautiful bridge being built right now. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Wade. Really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. That is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Inside CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. Also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From Etienne Wei and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. Good night.